Well, welcome back this evening. Thank you for being here, being in your place. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on the offering tonight and for this VBS program. Dearly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you so much for this night. Um, thank you for what uh, was accomplished this past week. Lord, I thank you and praise you for all the workers, all the um, student leaders that came out and helped the prepared and sacrificed their time for this event. And God, I, I just pray that uh, those seeds that were planted this uh, last week, Lord, that you would continue to bring people to water them, and then, uh, God, you would get the increase, that we'd see great and mighty things come, and maybe even hear stories one day of, of how uh, the gospel was, was presented at a VBS, and these kids gave their life to Jesus Christ. Lord, just work and move there in a mighty way. I thank you for the lessons that were taught. I know uh, I challenged my kids and made sure they know the, the verses, and I thank you for that. And I pray that you would help them recall those things at, at just the right time in their lives, Lord, that you would help them hide that word away, away in, the, in each one of the kids' hearts, Lord, and, and use it at the right time and give it to them at the right time. Lord, bless this service tonight. Bless this offering in a mighty way. Just continue to work and move here. Uh, like only you can, God. We love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I just had to start off, and I'm super nervous. Uh, you can probably tell in my voice. Okay, so we're here for our VBS presentation that we had this past week. Um, I don't know if you can tell by our shirts, but our theme was Shipwrecked, Rescued by Jesus. Um, our verse was from Psalms 34, 19. We had a great turnout. Uh, we averaged about 100 kids. Per day, our highest was 106, which was awesome. Uh, we didn't have any salvations that I know of, but we definitely planted and watered the seed, which is what this week was all about. Whew, okay. Um, with, with all that being said, though, we couldn't have done it without our amazing crew. So if you were part of the crew, can you all please stand up for a second? Uh, they came the Saturday before and uh, decorated, and Miss Elizabeth made the props, and they were just outstanding. Uh, so those who couldn't come, thank you for all your donations. All of our snacks were provided for. Um, all your prayer, that was the most important thing that we, could have, we, we needed this week was prayer um, for our just everything in general. You never know what uh, Satan's going to attack with, so we need to be prayed up. Every year we have a... Um, we collect money for a cause, and this year we chose the Rogers family to uh, receive the money. And uh, Monday, I kind of forgot to tell the kids that we were doing this. And so Tuesday, he actually came and did the opening and closing, and he spoke. 
So really, the kids only raised money for three days, Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and they raised $240. And it was a blessing seeing them bring in their pennies and their nickels and their dimes. And I'm not going to lie, I told him, I was like, it's little kids, so I don't really know how much to expect. We don't expect a lot. And I was not expecting 240. So when I was told that number, it was, it was a huge blessing. Um, so real quick, Brother uh, Jaron's going to come up, and I'm going to give them a check. And he's going to talk about a little bit about where the money is going to. Um, yeah, so uh, this is actually, uh, you know, I was thinking about it. I talked to my, my dad about it, and uh, he's also a missionary. As far as where this money could be uh, most used right now, and uh, there's a pastor of the building project going on right now. There's some other ministries, and uh, not that, you know, I personally couldn't use it, but I feel like it'd be much better spent in, uh, in, a, in a more urgent need right now. And uh, there's a pastor there that he uses his own, that he has a vehicle his ministry vehicle, um, but he uses it for all of his feeding center stuff, all of the food he buys, every uh, visit he makes. Uh, he, he really uses his, his vehicle for ministry only. And, uh, so his vehicle just uh, went kaput. It's gone. And so he's able to sell it for a little bit. So we want this money to go to helping him to buy a new vehicle, especially since Trinity supports the feeding centers there. And, uh, and so it'll go towards, uh, towards him and that ministry as well. So, so thank you guys. Good job. So the kids are going to uh, do three of the songs that we did for VBS, and then after that, we're going to have a slideshow.
I mean, I know they're walking out right now, but I want to tell Miss Ryan and Miss JJ and all of the workers again, thank you all so much for all of your hard work. And to everybody that decorated, oh my goodness, it's amazing. I mean, I, Miss Elizabeth, I know we talked uh, and, and thanked her and all of her family for all the hard work. And then everybody coming up here and decorating, getting ready for uh, the week. It was just an amazing blessing. I. Uh, someone said something to me and I looked it up on Facebook and I thought my heart was ju I just it just just was enlarged uh, with thankfulness just the heart and the love that people have uh, for each other here and to serve and to make things uh, excellent for the Lord for and for our kids and stuff it was just I was just like man praise God for our people I love you guys you guys are awesome again everybody who uh, made this possible from uh, any form even our teens serving and helping just an amazing blessing so thank you to everybody who was a part of that and just as ryan said i agree 100 percent there may not have been any decisions made that we know of uh, but seeds were planted and seeds were watered and again we're just supposed to be faithful to what god's given us and he gives the increase so uh, amen well tonight we have uh, brother jaren's going to come and preach to us again uh, as i said before uh, as long as they're in town uh, when get them, they're used to being busy. They're used to serving and, and, and doing ministry. And so uh, we want to give them opportunities while they're here. And uh, excited to have him preach uh, the word of God with us tonight. So you guys welcome Brother Jaron again tonight. Amen. Well, if you would, turn to Psalm chapter 2. I am, again, very grateful for the opportunity to preach uh, you know, one thing I know about uh, preachers is we really thrive on opportunities to preach, and I haven't had a lot of those, and so I'm really thankful for y'all, for, for, well, most of you for listening, some of you, I know what you're doing, and for your pastor for allowing me to have these opportunities, and I don't take lightly sharing the pulpit with your pastor. Um, I kind of put a title on this that helps me summarize a little bit uh, once I've got the idea, but this is 
This uh, is an open letter from God. So an open letter from God. If you know me, uh, you know that most like trendy things really uh, annoy me. Uh, and just this, the, the term an open letter, you know, it's written, uh, a letter that's written out on social media or, or published for everybody to read uh, concerning a controversy just to make everybody aware that this is where I stand and this is what I think and this is the truth on the issue. So I don't really like that in, in popular culture. It was the best thing I could think of to describe what Psalm chapter 2 is all about. Psalm chapter 1 and 2 are very connected. The Psalms were written as their uh, literature, they're poetic, um, they were sung or, or uh, spoken, but it was meant to be something that was done in front of the people. Psalm 1 and 2, uh, they kind of build on each other, different perspectives, but they're connected. A lot of people think they were either, uh, they were written at the same time, maybe read at the same time, uh, but, but it was understood that it was a connected idea. So Psalm 2, at the least, Psalm 2 builds on what Psalm chapter 1 says, and this is a Psalm of David, and it's from a different aspect, but builds on the idea. So what I want to do uh, as introduction is I want to read Psalm chapter 1, and it says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. It says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So in this passage, and, and it's something that I would suggest that you go back, that you know well, a lot of practical wisdom there, very great scripture uh, that I've taught before, uh, but I would suggest you go back, that you meditate on that, that you read that, but there are two options given, two options given and explained on an individual and the decision that you will make when coming to uh, worshiping God, uh, choosing his way or following the way of the world. Psalm chapter 2 is different. It's an overall eternal perspective, so it's more of God's perspective given to us so that we can see it. And it's written truly from the viewpoint of God looking over the perpetual state of the earth and mankind and, and his overall plan. So this is kind of big picture. Uh, uh, Psalm 1 is more individual basis. Psalm 2 is the big picture given and expounds on Psalm 1. It builds on that, but it's the overall plan. So uh, let's read Psalm 2. If you would stand with me as we read the Word of God. In Psalm chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, and be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. Amen. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your word. God, our prayer today is that we would bless the name of Jesus Christ. That we would worship him. That we would render to him all glory and honor and praise that he is due. God, thank you for your decree. Thank you for your sovereign plan, God. We know that you are in control and we know that you have all authority. May we be not like those who war against you, but those who humbly submit to your leadership. We love you, we praise you. It's in your name we pray, amen. You can sit down. So the first thing we see here, this is, this is again, this is poetic literature. It's broken into uh, four strophes, or four stanzas, if you will. And this first stanza, it's really easy when you're preaching in the, uh, I really think most of the time the text does this for you, but in this case, the text very obviously determined my outline. 
Okay, it's hard for me to make up something else because this is what it says. In the first part of verses 1 through 3, we see man's vain rebellion. So the main point, the thrust of this open letter written to mankind, what is it? That Jesus is the focal point of history. That Jesus is the focal point of history both in regards to God's sovereign plan and in regards to man's wicked, futile attempts to derail God's plan. So today I want us to recognize Jesus as the focal point of history. I want us to recognize him and as I pray to render him all the honor that he is due. The first thing we see here is man's vain rebellion, verses 1 through 3. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The question that, that the psalmist David poses is, why do the heathen rage? Looking at overall the picture of the history of humanity, these inspired words that David has penned down, why do the heathen rage is the question. This word rage is noisily assembled. In Spanish, the word is actually translated mutiny. Why do the heathen, and heathen doesn't necessarily mean pagan peoples like we would think, and when we say heathen the way we use the word, it just refers to the nations. Why do the nations, why does the world, why do they rage, why do they plan this mutiny? Essentially, it's a riotous assembly. It says, why do the heathen rage? It's a picture of leaders, we're going to see, working the people into a riotous frenzy. He says, why do the people imagine a vain thing? Why do they plot a vain thing? This word imagine is actually the same word used in ver uh, chapter 1, verse 2, when it's regarding the righteous man. It says, in his law does he meditate day and night. And here it says, these vain and wicked people, they imagine this vain thing. They imagine and they meditate on and they plan deeply and they think about their mutiny against God and his eternal plan. This word meditate is a, 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 it's a really impactful word. When we think about it as, as in Scripture, um, I've heard it said before that the, the word meditate originally kind of denoted the idea of a cow chewing the cud. The cow eats the grass, mulls over it, brings it up again. We won't go through the whole biological. But he brings it up again and he chews it again. And that's what we should do with the Word of God when we meditate on it. You don't just hear the sermon, oh, good job, pastor, see you later. That's not the point. When we read the Word of God, we are to mull it over in our minds. We are to ponder it. We are, we are to think on it. And what, what the psalmist says is when he looks at these nations that don't honor God, he says they meditate and they ponder and their lives are consumed with and their thoughts are, are provoked with imagining a vain thing. Vain what? It's worthless. He says they imagine a vain thing. We have wicked rulers leading wicked people in their meditation on evil. And it's empty. It's worthless. They're meditating some project which excites deep thought, but which cannot be effectual. One commentator said. Meditating some project which excites deep thought, but could never come to fruition. The psalmist, right from the get-go, points out these evil nations, points out these wicked rulers, and he begs the question, why do they do this? They meditate on something that could never come to pass to derail the plan of a sovereign God. It says they set themselves, the kings of the earth, these leaders, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. There's an overall evil conspiracy to overthrow God's anointed is what it says. Against the Lord and against His anointed. I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist per se and in culture and, oh, did, did George Bush do 9-11? And I don't, don't want to necessarily get into all that, but some of that, I mean, seriously, it's just a waste of time. Because what we know is there is an overall evil conspiracy, and it is to overthrow Jesus Christ as sovereign king and ruler. And the psalmist says, why would you ever consider such a futile attempt? Yet these kings and these rulers, they set themselves. It's not the picture of they consider it for a time. They meditated on it and now they have set themselves and purposed themselves against Jesus. They counsel together. Very similar idea to what it says in verse 1 
of, ver- of chapter 1. Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. We're not to do that. We're not a part of that. We shouldn't be sitting with them. We shouldn't be standing with them. We shouldn't be eating with them. We shouldn't be taking part of that. Yet these people have committed to spending all their time there. All of this is very important to understand the overall idea of what the psalmist is trying to bring out. This is the exact picture of what we are not to take part in. But they consume themselves the plan to overthrow God's anointed. His anointed, his consecrated one. In the immediate context, I'm sure David, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, didn't really understand all of the implications of what he is saying. So in some ways, it's David, I'm sure, lamenting somewhat of what was happening to him. But I guarantee you that David understood there was a much broader sense that the Spirit was inspiring here as he said this. So David might not have comprehended the mystery, but he surely understood of the anointed to come, the consecrated one, the Messiah that would come, and reflecting on this plan. Now, I'm always careful when I read something in the Old Testament. I think you should be too. And we just automatically say, well, that's talking about Jesus. And that's a prophecy about Jesus. We need to be careful about that. But one of the best ways to make sure that this is about Jesus is to see how other writers of Scripture used it. In fact, in Acts 2, uh, in Acts chapter 4, uh, we brought out this morning in Sunday school. When they were praying for boldness, they said and used this referring to Jesus and prayed this psalm praying for boldness. And instructing us that this is indeed talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have these rulers and they're raging. They imagine a vain thing and these kings of the earth that are leading the people against the Lord and against his anointed. So it's clear that David had some idea and knew that he was being used by God to pen prophecy and overall picture of the conspiracy against the Messiah. But it was not yet a mystery that had been fully revealed, as Romans 16 says. Before it was hidden, now it is revealed. Now we know. And now we can see the whole picture. Clearly, the plan thought out mutiny is against God and against his anointed. And they say in verse 3, what is their plan? Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So the bands here properly means the reins. The reins, and when we, as new creations, with a mind guided by the scriptures, look on our culture, what do we see? People like a wild animal bucking and trying to free themselves from the reign of an all powerful God. And obviously, David looking at that says, Why would they imagine such a vain thing? The ideas of a halter and and the horse being controlled by this. And these bands that these heathen want to rid themselves of. And they say, let's break these asunder and cast away. Let's make it so he can't control us anymore. How futile. In fact, not only futile, but so ignorant. I want to read a psalm. 107.14, referring to the redeemed. He's talking about us, the redeemed. It says, he brought them out of darkness in the shadow of death, and he broke their bands asunder. Why do the heathen do this? Do they not understand that it is Jesus who breaks our bands? And we know that we are under the power of sin, and Satan and the devil, and the conspiracy is of him. And he has these rulers in the palm of his hands, leading people like sheep, and meditating on this plan. This futile attempt. What they don't realize is that Jesus is the band breaker. He says to break their bands. How misguided they were in their counsel. Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even in a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He says, you were bucking and you were trying to get away from me and how many times would I have just gathered you under my wings and saved you, but you would not. Man. While God is willing to break the bands of sin and slavery to the devil, man would rather follow the wicked leadership of those who rebel against the Redeemer and the Savior. We see man's vain rebellion against God's plan to establish the messianic rule of Jesus Christ. You think God was worried about that? 
Do you think that God, seeing the rebellion of man and their vanity and their futile attempts, that somehow his plan would be thwarted, that somehow he would have some sort of trembling in him, that his plan would not come to fruition? Not at all. Not at all. We see God's... Was he trembling over the schemes of man? No, we see his unwavering confidence. His unwavering confidence. He says, He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his short displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I would say, and and I'm just going to caution you from here on out, I simply, I desire for you in your heart to say amen, to say so be it, that these things are true. But please, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you say amen, let it be with a trembling lip. Because these are strong words. Yes, we want to see God's justice over wicked, sinful injustice. We want to see it displayed, but we must remember that it is only the work of God in our hearts that broke Satan's bands that were on us. It says, He who is loftily above, he who sits in the heaven, he resides in the eternal. He laughs. Really, two times this picture of he laughs and then he has them in derision is this idea of mocking. The Lord will have or hold them in derision. The word Lord here is different than the one used before this in verse 2 and the one used after this. Those were the word Yahweh, the name of God. This is the word Adonai. And I talked to Brother Kyle about how amazing it was what his sermon was about this morning. Because Adonai is used specifically to describe God as sovereign and omnipotent. Whereas Yahweh above communicates the faithfulness of God, the self-existent one, the I am, the ever unchanging. This word Lord here uses Adonai, which communicates specifically his sovereignty over all things and his omnipotence. He is sovereign. We heard that definition today. Another way to say it is no one tells him what to do. He does what he wills. He fulfills his plan. And also he is omnipotent. He is powerful to accomplish his plan. There is no plan of God that he cannot accomplish because he has all power. So it says Adonai will laugh. The sovereign, all-powerful God holds him in derision. It's another way to mock. Specifically, it's to speak unintelligibly. It's to belittle. He mocks what they say, and he holds them in derision. Because theirs is an affront to a holy, sovereign, omnipotent God. Is he worried? No. It says he speaks in his wrath. Authoritatively, he addresses these people. He addresses these rulers. He addresses these feeble plans. The word wrath is the word anger or ire. Specifically, it's a picture of panting in passion. Guys, this is not a pretty picture. It says that he sits in the heavens in a laugh, that he will speak to them in his wrath. Psalms 110, 5 and 6 says, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. But Zechariah 1.15 says, And I am very sore displeased with the heathen, the nations that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, but they helped forward the affliction. The problem with the depraved man is that even seeing the wrath of God, even seeing the kindling wrath of God, he does not turn from his ways, but he runs even farther there. Romans 1 is a clear picture of that. But what displeases God, they don't care and they run there even farther. He shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. The word vex there is trembling from fear. 
he will vex them. When he opens his mouth, he will vex them. They will be trembling, their knees smiting together. We simply need to think of the king who was addressed by God, Belshazzar. When he saw God's hand, what did he do? It says his knees were smoting and he had no control, control over his bowels. He was so afraid. And when the king speaks, that's what's going to happen. That's what has happened. And it says his sore displeasure. This is something I did not enjoy discovering. It's the heat of his wrath. It specifically communicates his heat or his hot displeasure. It's kindling and it's growing. Psalm 58, 8 and 9 says this. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. It says before your pots can feel the thorns. What that means is sooner than your pots can feel the heat of the burning wood. He shall take them away as a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. I'm going to be honest. I sat in Starbucks studying this, and I literally felt compassion for those around me, knowing that this is the end. As a snail melts in the sun, so they will for the sword is pleasure of God. You say, man, this is a really bad picture. And it's true, it is. But it gets better. What is it that will vex them? What is it that he will speak that will vex them? What is it that will terrify them? Commentator said this, their puny challenge is answered by a powerful pronouncement. It's as good as done. His king will be enthroned on Jerusalem's most prominent hill. Amen. God's plan in establishing Jesus as king and as Lord, as Adonai, is what will terrify them. Do you know the idea of having two sovereign beings is impossible? But Jesus is Adonai. He is sovereign. And God is sovereign. So we see God's plan in establishing Jesus as king to us who are saved is the power of God. But to others, it is the sword of pleasure that will terrify and vex them one day. So we see that man imagines a vain thing. We see God's unwavering confidence. And then we see God's eternal decree. He says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, If thou art my son... This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. They had a better understanding in their day than we do of what decree was. Here today we have laws, but laws can be subverted. We have constitutions, but there's always ways around those. But in that day, when a sovereign king made a decree, it happened. It came to pass. Just like even in Daniel's day, when the king made a decree not to pray, and they caught David praying, and the king liked David, and he didn't want to, but he had made the decree, and there's nothing he would do, so he cast him in the den of lions. Right? They had a better understanding of what a decree was. The decree of a sovereign king could not be broken, and there was no interpretation or application otherwise. It was as he said, it came to pass. The difference from this decree to that of an earthly king is that this decree came from a sovereign, just, and righteous will of God, not from any external motivators, not from those men that were speaking in the king's ears trying to motivate or trick him. Our God is not tricked. Our God is just, and he is righteous. And when he says a decree, it will come to pass. He says, I will declare the decree. What is the decree? Verse 7, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Yahweh has said, the word here, Yahweh, the one who is always faithful, the one who has always been, the self-existent one has said, 
He has declared, Thou art my son, and this day have I got begotten thee. The word for son here is different than the word for son used above, which is interesting, but the word here specifically denotes the inheritance or the lineage or the chosenness of Jesus. It's a title showing lineage. It's rarely used in the Old Testament to refer to the Son of God. In fact, stated this way, it's only used twice. The idea is elsewhere, but it's referring to the Son of God. It says, this day have I begotten thee. We know that phrase, only begotten Son of God, right? I hope we know what it means. It doesn't show a beginning. It doesn't show that this day I begotten thee, this day I created. No. It shows his lineage. It shows the chosenness. It shows the revealed plan of God. Similar to uh, Colossians when it says that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. Does that mean he was the first? No. Exodus 4 says that, Jesus, that Israel was the firstborn nation. Were they the first nation? No. It indicated their chosenness, their lineage, that God chose them. When it refers to the only begotten Son of God, what does that mean? It's the choosing of God as the fulfillment of His eternal plan, His decree. He says, Thou art my Son, and this day have I begotten thee. What day? Was it some day in eternity past? No. Look at Acts 13.33. It should be up on the air. Acts 13.33. The early church understood this. It says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that what? He raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Romans 1 4. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, what does it say? And declared to be the Son of of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. When did God say thou art my son? When was he the only begotten son of God? When did the plan finally was it revealed? When Jesus rose from the dead. What was the day when Jesus rose from the dead? What amazing, wonderful thing to see how Scripture is connected and how we can see the sovereign plan of God and the decree that Jesus would rise. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto him, unto me, thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. He says, ask of me, and I shall give thee... That's my alarm, but I am not done. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth. For thy possession. Does that sound familiar? The inheritance. What is the son given? The nations. He's given the nations. Psalm 33, 11 and 12. It's not up there. It says, listen, it says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. He says, ask of me and I will give thee, the heathen, for thine inheritance. It shows the sovereignty of Jesus over all the earth. The uttermost, it means the extremities, the farthest reaches of the earth. What does that sound like, guys? Does it remind you of anything? How about Matthew 28, 18? And Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. My inheritance. Jesus says, it's mine. Now you go. What is the inheritance that Jesus has given? What is stated here? That the day that Jesus rose, it showed who he was and all power and authority was given him. He says, ask of me and I will give you the heathen for that inheritance. We're the heathen, guys. The uttermost parts of the earth... For, my possession, for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The rod of iron and the potter's vessel. The rod was either the shepherd's staff or the king's scepter. It was the same word. But it indicated the subjugating power of the king. 
and the potter's vessel dashed shows the, the, the ease at which Jesus will eventually judge the earth. It will not be a hard thing. It says, he has the rod of iron and he will dash to pieces like a potter's vessel. You see, this is David giving an overall picture of the eternal plan, the decree of God, fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the authority given to him. Truly, the crux and the point of this psalm is amazing. The point is to clearly enumerate the sovereign decree. And then finally, verses 10 through 12, we have a call to respond in worship of the Son. A call to respond in worship of the Son. You can't get this part if you didn't get the rest. He says, Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. I won't spend much time on this part. I hope that you'll go back and, and, and meditate on this. But here it says, Be wise now, therefore. You can put that at the beginning and say, Now, therefore, be wise. The tone changes here. What a beautiful picture. He says, now therefore, now that you know all that, therefore, and then we have patient instruction from, yes, a God that has all authority, yes, a God whose wrath is being kindled, but who is long-suffering and extending this call to worship the Son. He says, be wise. To hear these words and do anything apart from wanting to Jesus is utter foolishness. Truly, the wisest decision we could make is to trust in God's sovereign plan. It says, be instructed. This is correction or chastisement. God says that you are the world. You are in the world. And you're wrong. He says, now take correction and believe. Stop doing that. Don't follow them. Take correction. Take chastisement. Listen to instruction. Repent. He says, be instructed and serve the Lord with fear. The word serve here. Guys, salvation is never a call to a prayer. It's never a call to go to heaven. Salvation is a call to serve Jesus. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. What? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You see, we're under the bands of Satan. We're under the control and power of darkness. But he says to serve the Lord with fear. That word serve is the word bond service. It really is to be a slave. He said, be a slave to Jesus and serve him with fear. And then rejoice with trembling. When I first read that, I'm like, I don't get that. Rejoice with trembling. Why? Well, once I studied, I got it. When you read about the wrath and the sore displeasure of God, it's like a near-death experience where you came out unharmed. You're somewhat joyful because you know what almost happened. But you got so much adrenaline and you're, you're just thankful you didn't die. And God tells us who have believed to rejoice with trembling. This is not some flippant thing that we can do. This is not some fun party. We should rejoice that we were saved from the sore displeasure of a holy God. Guys, this is serious stuff. With fear, any person with a proper understanding of God will fear his wonderful, awesome, and holy name. Luke 10, 20 says, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen? You can say it louder now. Amen. Amen. Surely our rejoicing should be one of trembling. And he says, kiss the sun. There's five things. Be wise, be instructed, serve the Lord, rejoice with trembling, and kiss the sun. Say the last one is probably the most important. It is the will of God that you pay homage to, that you bow down to the sun. The kiss was the idea of paying homage to, to kiss the feet of a king. 
but also all throughout the Old Testament, it was very familiar as a way that you respectfully acknowledge someone that you knew intimately. What a wonderful picture. Intimately know the Son and honor Him that we personally honor and intimately know Jesus. He says, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. That last part, wrath is kindled but a little, is the exact same idea, exact same word used when he will vex the world with his sore displeasure. See, the reality is this. The unpardonable sin is not believing that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's sovereign decree is not realizing that Jesus is the Son of God and paying homage to and reverencing and worshiping and knowing Him personally. He says, finally, blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. You talk about ending on a positive note. It's an open letter from God to all the world for all to hear, whosoever will. It says to trust. Trust, what does that mean? It says flee to Jesus. Look at everything that is written in Psalm 2. And the last thing he says, blessed are you if you just run to Jesus. And if you're running for your life, you ain't taking no idols, right? Pastor Kyle? You got nothing. You're running for your life and you're running to the only one who can save you. The eternal sovereign Lord Creator, Jesus Christ. Just to close, I, I think that this psalm is clear regarding Jesus as the focal point of history and that we are to recognize him not in history of man, but in God's plan for history. On one hand, we see the effort of man to rebel against the authority of Christ and their refusal to worship Him. And on the other hand, we see God cementing in place and etching in stone His eternal plan, His decree to lift up Jesus as the only way to salvation and His wonderful, gracious, and long-suffering call for all men to trust in Jesus alone. Jesus knew that, and when He came, He said, All power is given me in heaven and earth. Pretty simple, the application is this. If you believe in Jesus, you're on the right side of history. If you believe in Jesus, if there's one thing I could do today is to give believers confidence, you're right. Jesus is the way. And if you leave this place knowing nothing else, then I know that Jesus is my Savior, then we can call it a day. Because Jesus is the one. You can have confidence that you trusted in the most worthy of all. And then, if you've trusted in Jesus, it's in your solemn duty to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ with great fear and rejoice with trembling, knowing how utterly urgent the mission is. Guys, if this, if 5 and 12 don't scare you, there is something wrong. For some reason, we forget about this when we go and read the stories of Jesus, but Jesus said the same things. And he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and teach all nations. This open letter, this gospel of Jesus Christ, the open letter of God, whosoever will, it is our job to communicate it to a lost and dying world. And then the other application is to those who haven't trusted in Jesus. I hope I've painted a clear picture of what it looks like to rebel against Jesus Christ. To do anything else would not be love, it would be hate. But know this, that Jesus is the sovereign Savior of the world. And that you must flee to Him today, because the other option is the worst thing I could ever imagine. So Christians, you trusted in the right person. And it's our job to go and tell other people. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. God, I pray that you would forgive me of any, of any words that I put in there that are not yours. God, I think that this is what your word says. I think it's clear that this is your plan for the ages. 
God, I thank you that the mystery to us is revealed. What a wonderful, wonderful time to know Jesus. To be able to see his life and his work and his sermons and his, his messages and his love to all of us. To those whom you minister to. To be able to see his character. To be able to read the people that came after him that you sovereignly commanded to write your word out that we could know. God, I pray that we would understand the mission at hand. And urgently take this message to share with others. God, that we would with great fear and rejoicing with trembling. That we would thank you. That we would be grateful for saving us. For placing the wrath destined for us on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sin. God, may you compel us to go out and to preach your gospel. If there's one here that doesn't know you, I pray that your spirit would not allow them rest until they surrender. They flee to the feet of Jesus and beg for salvation. And we know that you will give it because you are faithful to your word, ever unchanging. We love you, we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jaron. I uh, was thinking about the wrath of God as he was preaching, and uh, the, the thunder that sometimes shakes our houses when there's a storm, a thunderstorm, and sometimes it just startles you, like to the, to the innermost, if it's so loud. I know we've been uh, asleep at night, and thunder being so violent that it it wakes you out of a deep sleep, and you wonder what in the world just happened. And um, you know, I think about when we went to Israel um, and talking to the people there, and just the the thought they had, uh, and even now, of rockets just raining into their land, just terror and and um, just chaos. And I, and I thought, man, all of these things that bring terror and and fright and uh, you know wars and you know, we, we live in, in this bubble in America uh, where we don't have, I, I believe, a, a healthy regard for um, this trembling he was talking about. And we think that the wrath of an almighty God that is in control of the thunder, that um, the, the, the greatest power, the greatest demonstration of power in his displeasure being poured out on mankind at the end of time is a heart-wrenching thing, as, as Brother Jaron said, to think that there are people, as he sat in that cafe and, and was brokenhearted about the people around him, this is what people are going to face one day. But the amazing thing in, in, in that, I love that, is that's what God did on his son, took that wrath. He poured out the wrath for us. And who are we when we accept that, that gift, that that exchange. His, we get, as, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, that he became the, the right, we have the righteousness of God because of Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, to think that that's what we get. I was sharing that with, with our girls last night, and I said that it, it, it's a completely unfair exchange. We get the perfect righteousness of God. And he took our sin. He paid for our sin. Wrath of God poured out on the Son of God. And who are we not to take that message? As I said, the application, who, who are not to take that message that God has, has broken our bands, that, that we are, uh, that the wrath of God doesn't abide on us anymore. We are not appointed to wrath, the scripture says. But there are those that are still appointed to wrath. And it is our, it should be our humble privilege and our compelled passion to share with those that are in darkness, that are, that are going to face this wrath of God for all of eternity. We should, be, we, we should run out of these doors and say, God, 
Show me someone that needs your, your life. Someone that needs to be set free from those bands. And, and I pray that, that, that our hearts were stirred and I pray that you, you were captivated uh, by this, this truth again tonight. That God is sovereign. And he has, he has done what it takes uh, on behalf of mankind. Uh, but the amazing thing is that we have this, this privilege and this responsibility. And I pray that we take it soberly and, um, and run our lives that way. Uh, I want to take just a few minutes tonight um, to pray specifically for um, the effective um, sharing of the gospel. Uh, in our community, in uh, church planning efforts, and in our missions. Um, and if that means uh, God spoke, is, is speaking to you, or maybe that's a hard prayer to pray because you, you don't have a compassion, you don't have a conviction, you don't have a broken heart for the lost, then maybe that's what you pray. God, break my heart. You saved me. Who am I not to share that with other people? Um, you know, let, let's, let's pray for the effective sharing of the gospel. If it has to start in, in your life tonight, then pray, pray that. Uh, if you're doing that, then pray for us as a church to effectively share the gospel. Uh, pray for our church plant and other church plants. Pray for our missionaries that, again, the gospel, uh, the sharing of the gospel will be effective to the end that God uh, desires it. And so let's take about five minutes or so and pray for that, and then we'll open up the altar. And maybe you just need to respond to the message tonight um, or you want to pray over one of the cards. But let's take about five minutes. If, I'm, I'm sorry, before we do that, if you're a guest or if you're newer here and you don't know what we're doing, we're going to take time uh, to get in groups of two or three. And I'm just going to ask you to pray for that. One person can pray. If you don't feel comfortable praying, you don't have to pray out loud. Um, but I do ask that you to pray for, for what I asked you to pray for tonight uh, in groups of two or three or four, uh, however that works. And we'll do that for about five minutes or so. And then we'll open it up the altar uh, for individual prayer. So let's do that now.